it was said by some of the VC firms, if there's two companies you don't want to compete with, it is Amazon and it is Uber, because they are ruthless. To say we had to hit the ground running is kind of an understatement, right? And not know if we were going to survive or exist at all. They would call all our captains, tell them to stop working with us explicitly by name. It was the bad boy of tech that was entering our market. Our investors were freaking out. And I think the only one that did not freak out was Mudassar. Magnus and I said, let's time out. Let's see how we are going to compete and overcome this challenge. We realized that we were not going to beat them at tech, but we could definitely beat them on the emotional side of things because we were from the market. The region is different. And if we serve our customers and our captains with what they need here, you know, that's what we should focus on. Let's not focus on competition. Let's not obsess about competition. They forced us to raise our ambition level. We hired relatively junior people. They were actually doing decently well outside, ended up taking huge pay cuts because they really subscribed to Kareem's purpose in some shape or form and wanted to do good. I wasn't excited about joining a startup. At least that's what I thought until I met them. Got me super excited about their journey and I think they're quite special people. You could see before your eyes something being built, right? That's the difference. They come on board, they take on the mission as theirs and they are uh, missionaries, not mercenaries. As our first expansion point, we picked Doha. Not because Doha was, you know, larger than Saudi or Riyadh, but it was easy to get to. You could get visa on arrival and the flight was cheap and it was only 45 minutes. So let's write the launch playbook. Then we take the challenge of going to Saudi because we knew that the size of that opportunity, size of that market was way larger than anything else in the region. As the organization grew, more decision-making had to be delegated. The level of ownership that we had was like mind-blowing. I remember I used to suggest markets and almost want to launch the market and then inform Mudassar. A lot of us had a lot of personal sacrifices. Probably got a bit too intense at some point, but it really got everyone to feel the fabric of things moving in a very tangible way. We were very clear that the market that we had to be in was Saudi. Especially at that time, women were not able to drive in Saudi. So the opportunity and the problem was just way bigger than anything else. Now, how do you find the right talent in Saudi? We got to know Abdullah over a couple of months of, of actually working together. He was running his startup and we were running our startups and we were seeing each other at events, etc. I believe at that point, I was completely not interested. I just wanted to continue my startup. But then at some point beyond the business pitch, I really wanted to understand who is this guy? I just saw these people who are offering me to come on board, to do well and to do good at the same time. Uh, so I was completely sold from that moment. Abdullah was invited to come on board as a co-founder, underscoring just how important it was to Kareem's future to get it right in Saudi Arabia. It was a question of complete ownership on exactly the same terms as Mudassar and I had started. One of our key advantages is that we were agile, quick, to actually implement cash in Saudi. Customers were jumping on the service. Uh, in that year, we grew 10x, then we grew 10x again, and then we grew 9x. So we're talking about 1,000x in three years. In a hockey stick growth like that, that made all the difference. It wasn't just Saudi where Kareem's knowledge of the region kept them ahead of competition. Their focus on local problems meant they were rapidly trialing new approaches to meet local demands. Pakistan was the most unique market where you could not just uh, go to individuals owning a car and saying, come, come drive uh, with us. So in the US, about 850 out of 1,000 people own a car. In Saudi, it's about 400. In Egypt, it's 50. In Pakistan, it's only 18. So here we had a long list of people who were interested in, in working with us, but they didn't have a car. And so here we were building out uh, two databases, one of people interested in driving and one pool of people who were interested in buying a car and essentially hiring a captain and then partnering together to come and work with Kareem. We, we learned a lot and, and we learned to cater to different types of people. So in Dubai, we came across this uh, request of customers asking, especially the moms asking for baby seats. In an ad hoc way, 
a captain might come in and pick up a car seat. The captain would go back, serve the customer, come back to us. Madasa said to me one day, we could make this a service, right? Maybe we can launch it tomorrow. And we were like, tomorrow? And he was like, yeah, tomorrow. We collected around 20 odd seats. And then we started going to different locations where we knew uh, captains were saying, we're launching a service tomorrow. You have to keep this car seat in the boot. We trained all the captains on how to alter the car seats because you have children of different sizes. That's how the launch happened. Less than 24 hours. Kareem Kids now is one of the most uh, preferred services in Dubai uh, by the moms. Kareem's rapid growth was also putting pressure on their tech. Systems designed to handle thousands of customers were now supporting millions as the service gained traction across the region. Small cracks became major events. We ran our entire call center from uh, Dubai Media City on the 28th floor. One day, we get this little notice slipped under the door. Saying that there will be a electricity outage planned by the building because they were running through some maintenance. No electricity means no service, so we will have a proper downtime of not serving our customers and captains. What can we do? And then someone just said like, should we borrow electricity from one of the plugs by the lift, where actually it's an emergency and even if the light kind of goes off in the building, that switch might work. We ran down, we bought every extension cord we could find, and we essentially moved all our call center systems into the hallway or through extension cords connected to where the elevators were. To be honest, we were successful and we only had a downtime of five uh, minutes. None of the customers or captains knew that we were going through this crazy shit in the office. But I think this was the start of being bold, what actually meant in one of the values. Yeah, when we were in the office, someone knocks at the door, this is my card, I'm from CID. You've released this video. I was actually very shit scared on what's happening. <laughs> so Slingshot video had, uh, had an incredible Impact. So one of our more crazy colleagues, uh, Chris Eid, one of his ideas, which he kept secret until it sort of was live, was to make this video where we uh, pretend to shoot someone in a slingshot from one big tower in Marina to another tower and, and miss it. And we would do it unbranded. And the idea behind that was people would totally freak out. And they told us, can you accompany us to the local police station? We want to investigate this case. We told them about the story that there is, this is the first half of the video, the guy lands safely. And that's where they told us ASAP launched the second half of the video so that people don't panic and don't question what's happening. It got millions of views. Recently, I heard Elon Musk also commented on that video. And it's funny, when we were fundraising, we actually showed it to our investors, potential investors, as a sign of how crazy we are. Before the year was done, Karim would make an even bigger announcement. 